23. Let me read it to you. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is a great psalm. And uh, a psalm that perhaps is the best part known of the Bible. You often see cards uh, uh, with verses of Psalm 23 on. If you go to a funeral, it's often sung. Even in football, if you're at West Bromwich Albion's ground in Birmingham, in Smevik, along the side of the stand, they have the words, The Lord is my shepherd. In big letters, and every time a game is broadcast, people will see those words, The Lord is my shepherd. So although it's the best known psalm, occasionally it's not the most liked psalm. I went uh, years ago over to Middle Road to get some photocopying done, and uh, I took with me the music for The Lord is My Shepherd. A new version had come out, and we wanted to sing it on the camp we were going to. So I gave my book to the lady, and I said, can you photograph the music? And whenever they used to photocopy in those days, we all do it at home now, don't we? We scan it in. But whenever they put it on, the, they would always have a quick glimpse. Nosy, they are nosy. She looked at it, and then she put it in, put it down, pressed the button, and then she said, I hate that, she says. I hate that song. And I was shocked. I said, pardon? She said, I just hate it. I said, why? She said, well, it's all about death and funerals, isn't it? Have you ever been to a funeral when they didn't sing Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd? And I said, whoa, I said, you've missed the point. It's not about death at all, it's about life. Let me read you the words. And if you read it, the key phrase is verse 6. All the days of my life, not my afterlife, my life. I think they sing it at funerals because you're talking about quiet waters, green grass, being at peace. But actually, that's not the point of the psalm. The psalm is that in life, you can know God's presence all the days of your life, not just your afterlife. And when that life is taken, the Christian hope is we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a promise. So let me read it again, and this time you join in. When I pause, you say, all the days of my life. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, you don't sound convinced. Let's try that again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He guides me. Sorry, I missed a bit out there. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, he says, with all those guarantees, surely goodness and love will follow me. And when that life is over, and it's a fact, one in one die, when that life is over, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Colin. All the days of my life. So I missed the last bit off, but you were prompting me, Colin. That's why we, we need you back here every week. Now, it's a psalm of the living. And I'm going to just divide it up under a couple of headings. First of all, this is my first heading. Hey, my shepherd knows me. My shepherd knows me. You know, in medieval times, churches, I mean, this is a building, and it's really a block. 
It's, it's meant for practical use. We meet here on a Sunday. It transforms on a, on a Wednesday to Wednesday drop-in. It transforms again on Thursday to Noah's Ark toddler group. It transforms again on a Friday to kids club and youth club. And it transforms on a Saturday once a month to bodybuilders and other things as well. So this is just a practical building. The church in the New Testament is always the people who meet here. But we call our buildings churches, but actually that's unbiblical. It's the people who meet are the real church, and this is just the building. But of course, some buildings are more grand than others. Architects get there and they design great big churches, great big cathedrals. And in the medieval times, especially in Europe, they they designed what we call Trinitarian churches. Now, all churches believe in the Trinity, but they're called Trinitarian because they are three times higher than they are wide or long. Three times higher than they are wide or long. And the idea is that in medieval times, you went into church and you looked up and it just went on and on and on. And you went, wow. And the the design of the architect was to make you feel small in the presence of a great big God. So as you entered the building, you looked up and thought, wow, what am I compared to a great big God? And, and it is true, God is great. God is powerful. God is almighty. But don't think God is distant. And that's sadly one of the things those churches gave the impression, that God is so far away, he's not really concerned about you down there. He's in his own little world in heaven. This psalm tells us the opposite. God is a God who wants to be involved in the lives of people. He is not distanced. You know, the sun is 95 million miles away. That's far. It is big, it is powerful, and every summer I get sunburnt. That's how close it is. And the Bible says this great big God wants to be involved in our lives. And that's the testimony of the man who wrote this psalm, David. Let me just highlight that. In verse 1, my shepherd. He could have said the Lord is a shepherd. That would be true. He could have said the Lord is the shepherd. That is true, but he didn't. He said the Lord is my shepherd. It's personal. Verse 2, he makes me. Verse 2, he leads me. Verse 3, he restores me. Verse 3, he guides me me. Verse 4, you are with me. Verse 4, you comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare for me. Verse 5, you anoint me. Verse 6, again you have the word me and I. So we have a great big God, but don't think he's far away and uninterested. He's a God who wants to be involved in our lives daily. Just as a shepherd looks after his sheep, so God wants to look after his people. So that's the first point. My shepherd knows me. The second point is this. My shepherd provides for me. My shepherd provides for me. Let me just quote you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Hey, my shepherd provides all that I need for life. They say there are certain things you need if you want to survive. For a sheep, it needs safety from predators. Uh, Obviously, it needs grass, otherwise it would go hungry. And it needs water, fresh water, still water. A a sheep has got funny-shaped nostrils, and it cannot drink from running water. If it tries to, it will drown. So a sheep has to find water that is still. And if it's still water, it's not flowing, it can drink without drowning. So the psalmist knew his sheep when he's talking about it. Still waters, and for fresh grass, a a shepherd in Bible times might have to walk up to 10 miles each day to find grass in a very dry, barren land. So it was hard work being a shepherd. But the shepherd cared for the sheep. And then the shepherd made the sheep feel safe because at night he became the living gate. 
So at night, if you're out in the desert, out in the field, what do you do with your sheep? You look for some rocks, or you look for a hedge, or some trees, and you put your sheep in that little corner, and you would lie down in front of them. So that the sheep couldn't get out unless they jumped over you, and a wolf couldn't get in unless he jumped over you. You became the living door. And of course, that's one of the images Jesus used. He said, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate of the sheep. I look after my sheep and no one can get in and do harm to them. To get to the sheep, they have to come through me. He provides for me. Did you know to survive, you need four elements? You need air, water, food, and light. According to the experts, to survive, you need air, water, food, and life. The very four things God gives to us. Job could say this in Job 33, 4. The breath of the Almighty gave me life. The reason we're alive is because God gave us life. Life is a miracle. It cannot be recreated. It's a gift of God. And then we need water, food, and light. And when he was on earth, Jesus said, I am the living water. Hey, no one has to be thirsty for God. If you drink of me, I will satisfy you. Just, I will satisfy your spiritual first, just like H2O satisfies your natural first. And you know, when you've been out running and, and you come back, it's not a Coca-Cola or orange squash you need, it's water. It's water that quenches the thirst. Jesus said, I am the living water. We need food. And Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 on one occasion and said, I am the bread of life. No one has to be hungry for God. I will fill you up spiritually. What bread does to the body, I can do for the soul. You know, when I go to Moldova in about four weeks' time, I live on bread in Moldova. I can't have cheese and fatty foods. They don't agree with me. They, they send me uh, a bit loopy and upset my system. So I have to keep off cheese. I like cheese, but it doesn't like me. And in Moldova, they have lots of cheese and lots of fatty foods. And I look at it, and I can't eat it. But to be hospitable, I've got to eat something. So I grab the bread, and I have plenty of bread. So it looks like I'm eating and enjoying, and I'm not going hungry because bread fills you up. And Jesus said, what bread does for the body, I can do for you spiritually. You don't have to be hungry for God. And then we need light. And again, Jesus said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You don't have to be in spiritual darkness. God doesn't have to be a million miles away. He can turn the lights on. He can become real to us. We can know him and follow him and be directed by him. So my shepherd provides for me just like this shepherd provided for his sheep. Here's the third thing. My shepherd restores me. My shepherd restores me. As I drove into the car park, I looked at my, my phone and realized it was on the red bar. And it was just coincidental. I thought I had charged overnight. And so straight away, I just reached for the charger, I plugged it in, and when I later get in my car, I hope it will be charged or it will be charging as I next drive. But we're used to recharging a telephone because it runs down. It needs replenishing. It needs new energy. You can't live on just one charge with a mobile phone. You have to do it on a regular basis. And the psalmist says, look, every day, God, I need you to recharge me. I need you to restore me, to replenish me. And Christianity is not just about Sundays and special holidays like Easter and Christmas. It is a daily walk with the Lord. Jesus put it this way, if anyone wants to come after me, they need to take up their cross daily and follow me. It is a lifestyle that we embrace. It is a relationship we enjoy every day of the week, not just on Sundays and special days. And God promises to restore that friendship each day as we look to him. Now, I came across this beast. This is Alex, a sheep. And poor old Alex got himself lost. And poor old Alex spent three years, amazingly, away from predators. But the type of sheep he is meant that his wool just kept growing. 
And rather than me tell you, let me show you. But there was a sheep that was, hey, in good condition in the, with the shepherd, but got himself lost. But they found him and they restored him to former glory. Former glory. That is the gospel message. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We follow over sheep instead of following the shepherd. But the shepherd comes to look for us. And when he brings us back, he restores us, not just to a former glory, but to something even better. As was in the case of Alex. My shepherd, the psalmist says, restores me. And no one is too far God that God can't reach out and bring back. That's the good news of the Christian message. And he goes on to say, my shepherd guides me. My shepherd guides me. Do you remember the days before sat-nav? Some of us do. We're that old. But the days before sat-nav. I need these days. You put your code in on your car and it takes you to wherever you want to go. Most of the time. I hate the sat-nav in my car. And if you're having trouble, I recommend the, the app called Waze. W-A-Z-E, Waze. Brilliant little app, much better than the one in my Ford car. But these days, you put your postcode in and off you go. In the old days, you had a map. And as you were driving, you had to kind of unfold it or stop this massive map. Or you had a book, which was great until you got to the end of the page, and then you couldn't figure out where to start on the next page. It was never turn it over. It was always move on six pages or eight pages, and, and it was never in the same place. But these days, it's so easy just to be guided. But even better than sat-nav or a map is to have somebody who says, oh, I'll jump in and show you the way. 
And I quite often go places, and if there's a husband and wife, they'll say at the end of the church, oh, um, so-and-so will come with you to show you the way. And a guide is always better than a map. And the shepherd could say, or the sheep could say, my shepherd guides me. There was a sad incident a, a while ago of 15, well, yeah, 1,500 sheep in Turkey. There was a group of shepherds in Turkey who decided to get together and they put all their sheep together to make one big flock and they all went down, well, in Turkey, I don't think they went down the pub, but they all went off to get some food and some coffee and to, to smoke together. And what they didn't realize is out of this great big flock of 1,500 sheep, and it's a sad story, so if you're sensitive, plug your ears now, one sheep wandered off and jumped off a cliff. And 399 other sheep all followed him. And when they come back, there were 400 sheep less than when they started. Because sheep are stupid creatures. And we see that in the UK. You can drive down roads and, and, and if one sheep escapes out of the field, out of the gate, the other sheep in the field don't go, bye-bye, stupid. They'll go, oh, let's go. And they all follow him. And they all end up in danger. Hey, don't follow sheep, follow the shepherd. That's what the psalmist is telling us to do. Why? He is a good shepherd. He leads us to where we are safe, where the grass is green. And the water is fresh. He also, he says, my shepherd protects me. Even in the valley of the shadow of death. Now, you could put on that wall an image of the most ferocious animal in the world. What do you reckon the most ferocious animal in the world is? A what? An orca whale. Oh, right. Are they? So you could have a ferocious orca, you could have a ferocious gorilla, you could have a ferocious lion or tiger. Do you know what? I'm not scared because I'm hard. Whatever shadow's on that wall, I can handle it. But if you put the real creature on this stage, I'll be the first one out the door. It's the real thing that scares us, not the shadow. And all the time we're under the shadow of things could go wrong. But the secret is what the psalmist says. I'm not scared. Why? You are with me. You are with me. To have God's presence makes all the difference. Now, some of you might say, I don't like going to bed on my own. I don't like being in the dark. Can I have a light on? And then, can't you sit with me till I fall asleep? Well, perhaps we've all done that at some stage, or we've had children or grandchildren that do it still. Hey, to have the presence of someone there makes you feel secure and you can go to sleep because you know you're safe in their presence and that's what the psalmist is saying here we're always under the shadow of death we're always under the shadow of problems but we can handle them why because you are with me the presence of God removes that fear and even in death I've taken two funerals in the last fortnight both for Christians and it's good to say, hey, they are not lost. We know where they are. They're absent from the body, but they're in the presence of their Lord. And as John Wesley, the Methodist, used to say, our people die well because we know where they go. And then lastly, he says, my shepherd comforts me. Comforts me. He has a rod and he has a staff. A rod and a staff to comfort him a rod was like a club often they had nails in and uh, they were there for one thing if a sheep if a wolf came along to your sheep if you hit it on the head to chase it off that wolf that lion was not going to get your sheep you had a club so whenever the sheep saw the club it knew hey i'm all right i've got protection uh, when uh, i preached in turkey uh, it's in a place called antalya at the end of the church by the door there are two people there with guns armed guards and it's not to stop the congregation sneaking out while I preach I'm not that bad hopefully but it's just because now and again the church has been attacked by extremists and so they have to have armed guards on the door but when you see the armed guards you're not fearful you're hey they're on my side they're there 
to protect me. They bring a kind of a comfort. Now, we don't need them in the UK at the moment. Long may that continue. But in certain parts of the world, you do. And that's what the club did. For Whenever a sheep saw the club, it must have triggered, hey, that's there for my help, not to hurt me. And then he had a crook. And that was to show the care of the shepherd, just to tap it and keep it in line, or to hook it if it was in danger. So one was for protection, one was for correction. You protect me. You comfort me. And then they put oil on the sheep's head. You anoint my head with oil. Why would you put oil on the head of a sheep? Well, I'm told it's a bit like when you go on holiday and you put mosquito repellent on your body. The oil meant that when the sheep bent down to have the the grass or water, if there was a snake there, it would smell the oil and go away. It's a kind of a snake repellent. It's there to protect the sheep. So this sheep is well protected. It's got a shepherd with a club, a crook, and it's provided repellent to keep it safe. Oh, you can have this one for free. My shepherd exalts me. He says, hey, Even if I die, I have this hope. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that is the promise that the good shepherd made. Jesus himself said, I am the good shepherd. and Those who belong to me will never perish. I will look after them and I will not let them go. And even if they die, yet shall they live. That is the hope we have in Jesus. So it's a great psalm and it reminds us that all we have is because the Lord is the shepherd. We're just the sheep. We can't control the shepherd, but if we follow him, the shepherd will provide all we need in this life and the life to come. Let's pray. Lord, we admit that like sheep, so often we make dumb choices and we end up in a a, a bit of a pickle, a bit of a mess. But thank you that you are a loving shepherd. You understand our capabilities. You understand our failings. And you're a God who forgives and forgets. Thank you for that. Help us, Lord, as we ponder this little psalm, as we think it through, to see how it relates to each one of us. And help us to to discover you as the great shepherd who can be involved in our lives. So apply your word, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.